What's the plan, boss? The plan? We killed them all! Death to the stunnies! Well, I know everyone's busy with Immortal Empires right now, but seeing as it will be subject to a number of patches before it's properly released, I thought I'd give this game a look instead. Mark of Chaos. It's an RTS which has unfortunately lived its life in the shadow of Dawn of War and Total War Warhammer. Released in 2006, Mark of Chaos failed to spawn the same year spanning franchise that Dawn of War did. That's no surprise. Compared to 40k, Warhammer Fantasy never sold particularly well. In fact, it was so unprofitable, Games Workshop just nukes it and paves over the ashes with Age of Sigmar. Still stings, that one. Anyway, in present day, Mark of Chaos has some serious competition, as the Total War franchise has given the old world more life than Games Workshop could have hoped for. Although it is an opportunity they seem keen to capitalise on. But the question is, is Mark of Chaos worth playing today? Well, the core of the game is built around three campaigns. To progress, you move along a linear route on a map, connecting the various campaign battles. However, there are also towns which are necessary for the recruitment and buffing of your units. When approaching a battle, you're prompted to create your army from the units you have available to you. Each mission has a limit on the number of heroes, infantry and artillery you can bring with you into the battle, which is further limited by the number of units you have recruited into your pool. As you use troops, they gain experience and level up, affecting their stats and, in the case of the infantry, the model count. This does not just last for the battle, but is tracked across the entire campaign, including subsequent chapters. This provides a strong incentive to keep your troops alive, as an upgraded unit of musketeers is objectively better than a group of fresh recruits. Both will only cost one spot in your active army list. Once battle begins, that's it. The units you chose to take with you are the only ones you're going to have access to. There are no buildings or ways of getting more troops bar special game objectives. If your unit survives the mission, congratulations. Once you're done, they move back to your pool of units, possibly having earned themselves a promotion. If they're killed, however, that's it. You need to recruit some more from town if you want more. You aren't Nagash. You can't tell them to get back up and walk off a mild case of orc-inflicted massive cranial trauma. Unless that unit is a hero, that is. Heroes never die. Even the end times was hardly an impediment to some of the more popular ones. You can't kill your cash cows now, can you? Heroes are single model characters, and each hero gets special abilities they can use during combat at the cost of a power system. It is a slowly regenerating resource shared across all heroes in battle. Additionally, each hero gets access to their own skill trees, broken down into three sections. Combat contains skills which directly affect how your heroes can engage enemy units on the battlefield. Bright wizards, for example, gain access to fireball and other offensive skills which can be upgraded through the tree to do more damage. It goes from underwhelming to simply inadequate, at least visually. This has always been something that really annoys me. A fireball smacks into an infantry formation and half of them just walk it off like it's a sunburn. Heroes can be deployed on their own as a powerful fighter. However, you can attach them to any infantry unit in your army to convey advantages to them. Heroes spec towards the support tree can allow units to move faster or use a defensive bonus at an important moment. Stacking ranged buffs can help make an already fearsome gun line or arrow volley even more effective. The final skill tree is dueling. When your hero approaches an enemy hero, an icon will appear on the HUD, indicating a duel may take place. Duels are fights strictly between heroes and cannot be affected by any other units on the battlefield. It's justified in game as being an honor thing, in these duels, your heroes have access to abilities you unlock for them in the appropriate skill tree. These are similar to the powers they possess outside of the duels, focusing on damage, defense, or debuffing and interrupting the enemy. At no point in the entire campaign did I feel the need to devote any skills into this tree. Items can be gathered from defeating enemies through battle, and saved up to be used by heroes. Spamming basic skills unlocked by default by your heroes, and the liberal use of health potions, mostly meant I could stall the enemy indefinitely or until I defeated him. In the early stages of the game, duels are mostly initiated by you and you don't have to engage with the mechanic if you don't want to. However, by the late game, enemy commanders will actively seek you out and force a duel upon you. Regardless of whether or not you are the one who began the duel, the optimal technique is always the same. Stall the enemy with health potions, 
use your army to destroy the enemy army while the heroes are engaged, and surround the fight with your very best units. The final step is to dishonorably retreat your hero out of the duel. This leaves the enemy hero alone, surrounded, and about to be riddled with musket shot. This is the war against chaos. The only dishonorable act would be to be defeated. You know, unless you are chaos. In which case, who cares? If upper management calls you out, claim it was some Zinchian plot or something. Within a battle itself, most of the controls and objectives are fairly standard. Left click to select a unit, right click to give them an order. You don't have much control over formations, but a click, hold, and drag will prompt the game to try its best to arrange units into a formation with melee at the front and ranged at the back. It's not much, but it works well enough. On an individual unit scale, you have the option to have them stand in a loose formation where an individual unit spreads itself out to help mitigate damage done by artillery, and a line formation to assist in movement. The maps are decently sized, neither feeling too small nor so expansive as to be bothersome, although hauling artillery around can make moving units together a bit slow, as when they move as a group, they only move as fast as their slowest member. Additionally, defeating an enemy isn't the only option. There's a morale system in the game. It works much as you imagine it would. By breaking a unit's morale, it will begin to flee, with a chance to rally later. However, if it reaches at the map border, they run off and they are permanently removed from the battle. You know, a lot of this seems very familiar. Between battles on the campaign map, there is more to be done than just recruiting new units. The towns are broken down into four different buildings. The Temple, Armory, Barracks and Alchemist. Each battle you complete gives you gold you can spend here. The towns are all the same, regardless of the campaign. The temple is where you go to replenish units that have not been totally destroyed. And it is also here you can revive any heroes who have fallen in battle. The armory allows for units to be upgraded. Each unit can be individually selected and given upgrades to armor and weapons. They can also receive upgrades to morale and other abilities. See, if they don't have skill, you can just throw money at them until they can stand up in a fight. Both upgrades and experience do stack, so one isn't a substitute for the other. The final option here is the siege equipment. Units can be either given a ladder or explosive barrels for dealing with walls when sieging an enemy castle. However, you never ask to siege a castle without siege units, such as cannons, so it's a fairly redundant mechanic. The barracks is fairly self-explanatory. Use it to recruit new heroes and units. You cannot recruit from the barracks more than a given number of a troop type. This prevents you from fielding death stacks of all the same units. Later in the campaign, you can unlock some very elite choices, and they can be severely limited to just one or two. Finally, there's the Apothecary. This building is devoted to managing your heroes, buying and selling items with which to equip them. Again, I never got much use out of this place. Mostly only coming here to sell off items to save on clutter in the inventory. From here, you can equip your heroes with special armor and weapons, in a sort of light RPG mechanic. These really seem like they would be outside the jurisdiction of an apothecary, but okay. You can get a lot of these across the campaign. They can be useful, but again, not totally essential. One of the more annoying issues with the wider town and map system is the walk of forgetful shame. None of the town functions can be performed from the army formation screen as you prepare for battle. If you've forgotten something, you have to walk all the way back to the last node on the map. Luckily, it's not necessary to go all the way back to the last town. But this can quickly grow annoying, as you walk at an unbearably slow pace, and it is often only a matter of a few clicks in the shop, and you turn right round and head back to where you started. It feels like these two menus could have been consolidated when approaching a battle, as at no time did I feel like going into the next battle without having first healed my troops. There are also some optional missions. Although there are no real choices to make during the campaign, occasionally the path will split, and you can complete an optional mission for rewards. They're often just the same as regular missions, perhaps focusing on a different element. But in some respects, they're a bit experimental. Firstly, there are some entirely dedicated to the dueling mechanic. You and your opponent hack away at each other, one-on-one -on -one, like the civilized folk you are. After all, there's no faster way to illustrate your honor than at the end of a sword. Except, perhaps, out the barrel of a gun. Unfortunately, if you are relying, as I did, on merely holding them for a while until your armory is ready, these bouts can really drag on. There are also some hero team missions. Fairly early in the second act of the Empire campaign, your heroes can launch out on a mission by themselves. 
you know, to search for treasure. Why else sneak off from camp all alone in the middle of the night? In this mission, they function as they would in regular battles, not affiliated with the unit. This means they are not relying on the dueling mechanic. It works fairly well if your team is specced out in a way that promotes their combat abilities, and you can net some good loot for the rest of the campaign. Anyway, that's the general mechanics sorted. What about the story? The first of the campaigns focuses on the Empire and the Elves. At various points in the story, you will be prompted to switch between the two armies and progress along individual routes specific to them. Although narratively they will interact, your armies will never physically meet on the overworld. However, the mechanic is somewhat gimmicky and somewhat deceptive, as although you can change between the two at any time, you are often met with a message telling you that the other army can't move at the moment. The game knows when you're going to be the Empire, and it knows when you're going to be the Elves. It's just pretending, it's the illusion of choice. The story focuses on the efforts of Von Kessel and Aurelion. Aurelion? Elven names are not meant to be said in a Scottish accent. We have our own brand of gibberish, thank you, and we plan to stick to it. They fight together and attempt to hold back the forces of chaos invading the Empire. The story itself is fairly generic. Von Kessel has been marked on his face by his traitor's father and grandfather with the eponymous Mark of Chaos, and he's now sneered at by his peers. I'm fairly judged, pompous peers. Hope none of these people turn out to be evil. And took it in its infancy. Still, a lot of the voice acting in cutscenes and in battle is well done. The whole of the Empire looks upon this day, and should we fail, there will be no history to record our defeat. This is where we make our stand and prove the worth of the men of the Empire! For the entire game, I kept shielded men in the front to absorb the charge, and musket men in the back to lay down fire. Ranged units don't appear to have friendly fire, so there wasn't much need to manoeuvre out of formation. More often than not, Orcs and Chaos Warriors died before reaching my lines. I began to use Bowman to scout ahead, whose stealth ability allowed me to sneak up without detection. This, in turn, allowed me to fire cannons at the enemy before they really knew what was going on. The elves, however, are not enlightened enough to see the virtue of black powder, and instead relied on bows. The process, however, was largely the same. Incidentally, you can toggle unit ranges in the option menu so that they show up on the map as a dotted green circle. You're gonna want to do that. By the end of the first act, you'll be laying siege to your first castle as the Empire, which makes a nice change of pace. Unlike the other missions, siege missions have a timer forcing you to assault the walls, which adds an appealing element of pressure. You're given 10 minutes and two allied cannons with which to shred the walls apart. However, later in the game, you'll be forced to maintain your own siege units for the campaign. The ending mission sees you switch roles and defend a fortress rather than attack one. It's actually fairly easy, and in my case the champion of Korn, which was supposed to represent the final boss, fell before even reaching my units under the withering firepower of Null's finest, including the two fully upgraded hardened veteran musketeers, which were the same two I'd been using from the beginning of the game. Still, there was some spectacle in it, as the opposing army is large and approaches in several waves. My advice? Let your AI-controlled allies man the walkway approaching the fort by themselves, while you bravely sit behind the thick, fortified walls, offering moral support. Strangely enough, your siege units cannot man the walls or fire over them. Again, that seems rather familiar. So they have to be set outside the front gate to have any effect. However, covered by musketeers and shields of your veteran soldiers, they should be fine. This campaign will also, occasionally, Allow your empire and elf armies to work together, drawing from the same unit pool to create one united army, which plays well to the campaign's theme of cooperation. The last mission is one such joint effort, meaning those magic-loving hippies can see how it's done. You see, the empire doesn't train soldiers. They train surgeons. And their speciality is the lobotomy. Each can replace a cultist's loving memory of grandma with white-hot lead faster than you can blink, as a bullet digs its way through his prefrontal cortex. The Chaos Campaign, mechanically, shares a lot of similarities in the way the campaign movements, battles and heroes work. 
However, there are some differences which make it far better in my opinion. Firstly, rather than ending the first chapter with the siege, you, as the chosen champion of chaos, have to undertake some thematic trials in a dungeon. Upon success, you are given a choice which does affect the campaign, if only slightly. You can choose a patron god, between Nurgle or Korn. By selecting one, your model changes to be more representative of the god you've chosen. Given the theme of the last few years, there was only one choice. Having received Nurgle's blessing, there is also some small mechanical changes to your hero, where some powers change. Additionally, moving forward, you gain access to some specific units, such as Plague Bearers and Knights of Nurgle, unique to your god. As you progress through the campaign, you end up vassalizing a clan of Skaven. They are the second faction you split the campaign with. As a faction, their warp Giselles have incredible range, and their artillery is so fast you don't require to lead the target at all, making them by far the best way to deal with enemy infantry. I know I've spent a lot of time talking up the Empire, they are the coolest faction after all, and that's a fact, but these little fur-fest rejects definitely have the superior weapons. The chaos side of this campaign is definitely the focus. While the Ratmen were busy snorting or crushed warpstone or whatever it is they do, the Champion of Chaos was actually having a bit of an arc. He will eventually be betrayed and forced to fight the army of the god he didn't choose earlier in the game, and soon after ascending to become a demon prince. The ending sees your Chosen of Chaos, along with the Skaven, assault the same castle you were defending in the Empire campaign. You even get to cut down the heroes you played with at the time, but as the Chosen gives his speech, declaring the downfall of the Empire, the camera pans up to see a new greenskin threat. The final campaign is based around the Dark Elves and Orcs. Rather than cooperation, this campaign's main themes are deceit and revenge. The Dark Elves have come to kill a High Elf, but their numbers are small, so they deceive an Orc Wa into acting as a battering ram and ploughing through the human and elf lines so they can get at their target. How do they do this? Do they lie and trick the Orcs? Blackmail or bribe? No. They leave shiny things out for the Orcs to follow. The Orcs, being the intellectual equivalent of a magpie, follows the shiny things. As the theme of the campaign is not cooperation, there is no point at which you meld your armies or anything like that. However, individual factions are represented well. One of the Dark Elf missions, for example, focuses on the stealth infiltration of a human fort, opening the gates for the marauding orcs trying to break through to the other side. At no point do you interact, and the orcs are far too thick-headed to realise you're there. It revolves around the careful manoeuvring of a group of heroes around patrolling enemies with side objectives of poisoning wells. The final mission sees you taking over your choice of faction to attack the other, which is a nice change from the previous two which saw your forces unite. Interesting though that even the Skaven, a faction known for not being able to keep their shit together for more than two minutes in the lore, manages not to backstab anyone, but the Dark Elves do. Guess that's a testament to the sheer aura that absolute demon gives off that he can keep the plague-infested Stuart Little wannabes in check. It is regrettable that your enemy's roster does not reflect what he was left with when you chose your side. Although definitely subject to being gamed, it would have been a nice tie into the world. So, you're done the campaigns. Now what? Well, there's a skirmish mode. The skirmish is basically the campaign battles without the structure. Interestingly though, you can select between a number of different sub-factions, and they do have a slightly different roster of troops they can recruit. Chaos, for example, can be played as Undivided, Nurgle, or Korn, each with their own appropriate units. These forces can then be supplemented by mercenaries. In the case of the Empire, these are the Dwarves, and will allow you to add Giants and Grudge Throwers into your army. Can someone please tell me why every bright wizard looks like he needs directions to a methadone clinic? There must be something in the lore for that. Building armies in this mode is done around a points system, where bigger better units cost more points to put into your army. The number of points available for the battle can be changed, allowing for very small to much larger battles. It also offers the choice of partaking in siege battles once again. It's a fine enough system for offering more of what you've already experienced, but doesn't offer too much of its own. 
And so we circle back to the ultimate question. Is this game worth playing when there are other options available in Total War Warhammer and Dawn of War, presuming you don't mind the switch to sci-fi? I think so, yes. I know I've offered enough criticism of the game here to earn my name a place in the Book of Grudges, but ultimately I think it's a decent enough time. The battles are mostly fast and arcadey, but with decent controls, and enough points during the campaign to allow you to strategize. Although the stories may only exist as an excuse to move the player from battle to battle, they serve the function well enough, and I was even fairly invested in the Chaos campaign to see what would happen to this destined champion of the ruinous powers. That being said, it's not going to replace Total War for any real length of time. But it is still worth it for the standalone experience. I think one of its biggest problems is its difficulty. It's a fairly easy game, and because of that you don't actually have to engage with many of the mechanics, especially those revolving heroes, things like equipment or powers during battle. It is held back by the lack of unit formations and some small mechanical issues which can be damned annoying at times. The hero dueling mechanic was a bit of a miss, and I normally tried to avoid it entirely, and when I was forced into it, it was just a slog of activating powers and spamming potions. Kitting out a hero to deal with this would probably make the match more fun, however I'm unsure it's really worth sacrificing a hero's ability to buff his allies or fight better in a battlefield. Someone looking to micromanage a bit more could easily get something out of this system. However, they're probably busy playing EVE, but if you're interested in trying it, you can get it from GOG. While flawed, it is not worth being shuffled off into the bin of extremely bad Warhammer games to be forgotten with the rest, and instead should be given some respect.